Everybody knows that last year was a crazy year for video game releases. If you didn't have a backlog before 2023, then you almost certainly do now. So allow me to be the first to welcome you to a world of paralyzing frustration at having far more games than your free time allows, and overwhelming burnout for reasons that you just can't seem to put your finger on. Well fear not my intrepid viewer, I am here to tell you that this is okay, and that you can do something about these fantastical new mental problems you now have to associate with your favourite hobby. If you're new to my channel, here's the TLDR. I am on a mission to clear my video game backlog, but in a way that doesn't burn me out even further, and I have been sharing my progress with you all thus far. I've been looking into ways to address this for a while now, and I'm thrilled to report that my current approach seems to be working. In fact, it's doing so well that I dread to think how long it would take if I made individual videos for each of these games that I've cleared. So, let's make some lists. What you're about to see is a total of 10 items, 5 games and 5 pieces of DLC, all recently cleared from my backlog and all from the last year. Okay, so technically one of these is actually from this year, but it would be weird if I didn't include it today. You'll see when I get there. Final Fantasy XVI is one of the best action RPGs available on the PS5, and it's more Game of Thrones than anything else I've seen since the end of Season 8. I didn't know there'd be a dragon! Between your main character being Jon Snow and your best doggo being Ghost, there being not one but two Cerseis, your trusty Sean being like Mentor who of course dies at the end of Season 1, and a big scary dude who turns into an even bigger scary dude made of rock, and if all of that was too subtle, here he is being an actual mountain. Though all of that being said, your core cast of characters are all much more likeable than their GOT counterparts, with Clive and Jill in particular being super adorable. Is there anything you wanted to buy for yourself while we're here? There was, yes. Well, sort of. Molly in the kitchens told me about a place that sells particularly good pies. Thought you might like to share one with me. Final Fantasy XVI has a truly spectacular combat system, that'll have you stringing together crazy combos and swapping between your elemental powers on the fly like a pro in no time. The story manages a solid balance between Westerosi-style power struggles and standard Final Fantasy weirdness, and through the power of the PS5, you now get to control the massive summon monsters in ridiculously epic Pacific Rim-style battles. If you take on the Final Fantasy difficulty, be ready for some tedium though. If you equip the accessory that auto-dodges, then the whole thing just becomes an exercise in patience, as you slowly whittle away massive health pools. Honestly, it depends how badly you want the trophy, I guess, but the base game experience is spectacular. Echoes of the Fallen is a short but very sweet climb up a tower constructed by the Fallen. You come across these guys plenty of times throughout the main journey, but they're never really fleshed out all that much. Sadly, this does remain the case here, but you do still get some nice insights into the things they did and what their motivations were. The combat is as spectacular as ever, and it all comes to a head against a very challenging end boss. Personally, I love seeing any kind of swords and sorcery heroes trying to make sense of modern technology. I'm always fascinated by how they interpret things like alarms and sentinels. Initializing iconoclastic defense system, Omega-1. What the hell is an iconoclastic defense system? You can always tell when the actors are actually happy to be back on a project, and it really does give things a lift. I was also pleasantly surprised by how much humor is injected into this DLC, especially in how it starts. Look! Behind you! An Akashic monster! If you think I'm going to fall for another one of your cheap tricks... Clive, trouble. What? Oh. Final Fantasy XVI is the only game I have ever played where people speak in a Yorkshire accent, presumably because somebody on the design team googled where Sean Bean grew up, and this is where I have lived for most of my life, so a lot of the humour lands very nicely in my house. Over here! I can smell the one who shat himself. Yeah. 
Okay, so here we are at the DLC released in 2024, but you see what I mean, right? I couldn't really cover the base game and the first piece of DLC without including this one. But anyway, let's talk about the final adventures of Clive and Jill, as they cross the narrow sea and hang out with the Targaryens beyond the wall. Yes, really. What are the people beyond the wall like? Rising Tide is a much meatier chunk of content than Echoes, with a lush new area to explore, some really cool story beats, excellent nods to older games, literal Targaryens, and not one, but two new sets of icon powers to unlock, as well as a brand new kaiju battle to look forward to. And as you'd expect, it is suitably epic, but far too long. And avoiding spoilers as much as possible, it is my duty as a human to warn you about the third phase, because you will need to get your combo timings down if you want any chance of surviving it, even on the lower difficulties. When the story is wrapped up, you're introduced to a bloody powers type challenge arena and your second set of new icon powers. If you're a big fan of the combat, this is where you'll get your money's worth. Nice clean re entry. I mean, just wow. Dead Space is not just an exceptional reimagining and a beautiful game. Dead Space is an absolute masterclass in atmospheric horror and sound design. The pressing silence, the muffled gunshots when you switch to zero gravity, the way cold crystals appear on your suit, every detail is perfect and they swap in so naturally as you change between the environments. The pitch black is so well done too. It could have been annoying, but between the lit areas and your weapon's narrow torch beam, it's all done just right. And so often, I won't know an enemy is there until it attacks me, or I happen to pick up on a noise that feels like it's right behind me, and a lot of the times, it is. Playing with headphones is a must. The pacing is super tight, and the objectives also fall on nicely with the story, and nothing ever feels forced. In one part, you have to restart a massive centrifuge, which involves using stasis to slow down some rotating power connectors, then magnetically dragging them to where they need to be before they start up again, and then when it has been restarted, you have to duck between the rotating arms to make it back alive. I watch a lot of horror, so I can take or leave the jump scares to be honest, but overall, this game is a perfect balance of atmospheric scares and an excellently paced adventure. Isaac, what's your status? Do you have the captain's rig? F*** me! Ugh. Transmitting codes now. You there? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. I'm here. Released alongside the incredible Phantom Liberty DLC, the 2.0 update overhauled a ton of systems here. I played through the base game when it got the PS5 upgrade, and I had a decent time zipping around with a katana but this time I really got into the granularity of using quick hacks and firearms. The new perk system allows for a lot more fine tuning in your build, like increasing your reload speed and giving you brief time dilations when you chain headshots. The new perks introduced with the DLC feed in very nicely here too, especially if you go for the tree that highlights enemy weak points. There are also passive perks that level up in the background depending on your actions now. Between all of this, a clothing transmog system and improved crafting, customization is now the name of the game. Basically, Cyberpunk now feels like the game it was supposed to be, with deep systems underpinning a spectacular world and excellent writing and performances. I need to arrange a passage for you to Washington. No, Reed. We need to talk first, all three of us. Here. The President, a Merc, and a Special Agent walk into the Oval Office. Take the stellar world of Night City and all of the insanity it comes packaged in. Throw in a super high-octane political spy thriller, introduce some delightful new mechanics to really freshen up that mission variety, and then, just for the hell of it, package it all in with one of the most obnoxiously handsome men on the freaking planet. Not a phrase I often hear in this trade. That's what you get here, guys. The Phantom Liberty had me hooked from the very start, where I was able to jump ahead in the story as a level 20 build and dive straight into the action. 
The preset build was really useful for getting to grips with a new perk system, and I enjoyed it so much that on rolling credits, I immediately started a brand new playthrough. The new area Dogtown is kind of a dump, but everything else is just 10 out of 10. The writing is top notch and every character in the main plot will surprise you at least once. I won't go into any detail for spoilers, but trust me when I say there is a hell of a lot to unpack on this one. Give it a taste! Rusting piss, shit bud! And it's a true testament to the writers how Keanu Reeves, the most anarchist anarchist there ever was who just so happens to live in your head, and here's security, ha <laughs> ha is so often the voice of reason, who helps you make sense of whatever insanity has just happened. Usually love a bit of hard to get, but trust me, rarely ends well. And you might just need that moment or two to collect your thoughts. After you use an implant that lets you take on the voice and appearance of a famous contract killer, or when you break into an influencer's house, and literally the first thing you find is a sample of their bathwater. And I do have to give special mention to this scene, where Johnny mimes to you how to use a landline telephone. <laughs> the original Persona 5 is iconic. It is the game that has been remade and re-released more times than either of The Last of Us games in half the time frame, and yet nobody ever gets mad about it. Obviously, I pre-ordered Tactica, and I'm pleased to announce that for the most part, it was absolutely worth it. I love a good tactical RPG, and Persona 5 has made that transition with buckets of style and all of that signature charm. Instead of worrying about individual enemy weaknesses this time, your main concern is whether or not an enemy is in cover. When they are out of cover, it really opens up what you can do to them, and before you know it, you can chain smash entire levels worth of enemies without them even getting in a turn. In fact, there are some side quests where you're literally tasked with completing the objective in one turn, and it is oh so satisfying when you figure out the right order. One thing I do have to critique though is the storytelling. You will eventually reach an extremely satisfying payoff as far as the new characters are concerned, where that signature atlas writing really gets a chance to shine, but the road to that point is very unevenly paced. That's right. Right. The original Persona 5 walked a fine line between Japanese storytelling and more Western styles of delivery, and as someone who struggles with anime, I really appreciated it. Tactica, however, throws all of that away and just goes full on anime. It's things like someone saying something utterly ridiculous, and then following it up with that same character saying, in other words, blah, blah, blah. Damn it. Would you just speak English? You're not making any sense. I mean, if it sounds stupid, then just don't say it. And then we have the single biggest anime trope of all time, the one that bears absolutely no resemblance to how real people communicate, the anime grunt. Here we go! Futaba's line repetition really got on my nerves this time too. But it's not really fair of me to call this out, because if there's one thing we all remember about the original, it's how often Mona thought Joker was looking cool. Too slow. All, right, Joker. all in all, this is still a really great game, but eventually you do have to wonder if Atlas are ever going to let the Phantom Thieves graduate. Perhaps you'd prefer I hadn't cut in. Senpai, you're not hurt, are you? Yeah. Huh? <sighs> okay, this one's actually really cool. When I saw they had made DLC for Akechi and Kasumi, the two biggest additions to the royal story, I just couldn't say no. Repaint Your Heart is a completely self-contained side adventure that takes the core gameplay loop and adds in a paint mechanic that overrides everything else by making whoever is not associated with that paint colour automatically break out of cover. It's such a simple twist, but it adds just enough to the experience to keep things different, and it switches up the pacing nicely too. But let's be honest, we're all here for the characters. 
Akechi is still a pompous know-it-all. I admit, you never fail to impress. But we all know that having him in your party was always a high point. And Kasumi is somewhere between if the Matrix did a crossover with some pirates, so what's not to love there? It's a short but sweet addition to the main campaign, and avoiding any spoilers, I do enjoy picking out the more amusing dialogue options, knowing what I know about how a certain character's story plays out in the original. Pancakes. I don't want to hear that word again for a long, long time. One of my absolute favourite things about the remake renaissance we're going through at the moment is how much these remakes are innovating and leading the charge with new ideas. The original Resident Evil 4 recreated the wheel when it pioneered the third person over the shoulder genre, and the remake manages to perfectly balance being faithful to that beloved original whilst also increasing the scope, reimagining iconic set piece moments for the better, and adding in plenty of extras such as all the merchant side quests. It also does a stellar job of improving the delivery of the story, and it continues the trend from the other remakes of exploring the mental health of the core characters, and I think that's brilliant. However, the base game isn't why Resident Evil 4 was in my backlog. I played over 100 hours last year after all. No, the reason it's here today is because I finally finished a professional difficulty run, and briefly toyed with the idea of going for the Platinum Trophy. After months of procrastination, I took my time and really enjoyed my professional difficulty run, I still use the rocket launcher quite a lot, but overall it really wasn't that bad, and if you're struggling on the late monster, I found that keeping the boat on the right made it a lot easier to handle. I wasn't too bothered about the trophy, I just really wanted the Chicago typewriter. When I got it however, I did briefly wonder about going for the other trophies, but when my hardcore S plus run turned out to be mostly this, I quickly got bored. If trophies are your thing, then go for it, but for me this was so far removed from the core experience of the game that I absolutely adore, so I include it here as a cautionary tale. We all knew this was coming, Leon basically told us so. I think we both know this, it's where we go our separate ways. Ah, ah, he said it, he said it! But nobody knew it was going to be as good as we got. Ada's return, much like the main campaign, was faithful to the original but beautifully improved in every way possible. Separate Ways again takes place alongside the main campaign, having now been rewritten to accommodate the new story beats and it really does a lot to flesh out Ada as a character as she gets her own story, as well as fill in a few plot holes. Gameplay-wise, Ada is still twice the ninja that Leon will ever be, and this fits in so nicely with her Spider-Man style grappling hook. Like any good piece of DLC should, Separate Ways changes just enough from the original to keep it faithful but also fresh, like adding in detective vision and some unique weapons as well. And if you are wondering about those iconic moments from the original that didn't make it into Leon's new adventure, I give you the drill from Total Recall, the U3 test subject, and the laser wall of death. And there we have it guys, those were 5 games and 5 pieces of DLC that I have cleared from my backlog from last year. Have you played any of these games? What were your thoughts? Let me know in those comments, and if you'd like to support my channel, please do consider liking and subscribing. As always, you can follow along with my backlog progress using the link in the description. The project has been progressing a lot faster than I thought it would, so expect more multi-game videos as I try to catch up with the games that I have managed to clear so far. Thank you very much for watching guys, see you on the next one.